Okay, uh, welcome to the ninth lecture on multibody dynamics. Uh, far away. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to get the other screen working, but um, no can do. So we only have this screen. I don't know how this how to set that up. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, mute the sound. So uh, what are we gonna do? Yeah, let's. Then I no. Oh, let me check. Did I start the recording? Yeah. So what are we going to do? Uh, lecture 9, uh, Newton Euler equation motion for a 3D body and rotation matrices and Euler angles. Um, but the most important thing is this, right? Wow. Yo, I'm going to learn nothing. Uh, no. So, yeah, th this is like an introduction to the more complex uh, rotational description in space and with matrices, rotation matrices, and Euler angles, Euler parameters. I need to get up to speed. It takes me some time for that. You uh, have been busy with a homework assignment, and, and yeah, they were, were a lot of work. If you wanted to have it top notch uh, in LaTeX with all the nice, fine formulas and so on, that's good. Um, so, we have a, a week of relax in that sense. Then um, let's move on to how, how does it go for the future then. Uh, for lecture, oh, I thought I posted it. Well, uh, for lecture 10, there's a homework assignment. And then for ele uh, lecture 11, there's also a homework assignment. But they are then homework assignment 9 and 10, right? So we have in total 10 homework assignments. But they're sort of nicely spaced now more. Because there is one lecture which drops out due to a session day yeah, on Thursday. Name of I don't know. Um, so that, that gives the, uh, you a bit space. Um, well, not really, because of course when I hand out the assignment, you have to hand it in a week after that. But still, uh, it stretches the whole period a little bit. Okay, that having said, and then uh, lecture 11 is the last one. Uh, although, according to the schedule, there are more lectures scheduled uh, in this period. But um, I mean, my time is up, and your time is probably also up. So that's just the end. And of course, then we have the exam. Uh, I like to stress again: you have to take the exam to get a final grade. You have to take. The, you have to be there. Uh, it's not that you say, "Oh, I have all the homework assignments good, and it's seventy percent, and forget about the exam, and now I will get a final grade." No way. You have to be there. Okay, uh, questions on these general remark things? No, I'm super close. Okay, let's start with the uh, Kahoot, right? Kahoot. Kahoot. Ah, uh, yeah. My Kahoot. Uh, number nine looks good. Okay. Hmm. Let's start.
very quiet in the room. Please discuss. Okay, so this asks for some feedback from me. Um, so what went wrong? Why do a lot of people say four? Well, if I look at the mechanism, then um, of course I can do the counting hey, with the number of rigid bodies and the, and the degrees of freedom. I'm not going to do that. I'm now going to explain it like, oh, I see here a four bar mechanism, right? So if we want to cut the loop, we have to cut it here. Then. These are, yeah, things which are still closed loop, right? This is also like a four bar, well, no, even more, five bars. So I have to open this loop. So I have to cut it here for this loop. And then for this loop, I have to cut it here again. So I have to make three cuts in two directions, making a total of six cuts. Then you would think, yeah, and how about this one? Well, that's a force element, right? That's a spring. It's not a rigid body. So this is just a force applied to the system. There's nothing to cut there. Okay. Um, lesson learned, right? You have 90 seconds. Take a piece of paper, draw pictures, discuss with your neighbor, put in... Um, special angles or configurations. Mm. Yeah, so those who are in the red league, very good. Um, those who tried to look it up, but things probably went wrong. Um, so for those, uh, yeah, it's more than uh, halfway, so I have to discuss. Okay, um, we're talking about lateral velocity in point A. That should be zero, right, in this direction, meaning that we have to project all the velocities on this, uh, uh, on this line and perpendicular to this line. And first of all, how do we find the speed of point A? <coughs> it starts with the speed of the center of mass plus the relative speed of point A with respect to the center of mass, which is just omega times r. Well, and that is perfectly uh, perpendicular to this, this line. So there should be omega times A um, in the equation. Plus or minus, we still don't know because we can decide is it this direction or the other direction. Eh? That's true. So plus or minus a omega. But then the other velocities of the CM, well, they have to be projected uh, along the line and perpendicular to the line, and we need the ones perpendicular to the line. And then take, for instance, uh, one speed, uh, the vertical speed is maybe the simplest one, or horizontal, that's, well, let's say the horizontal one, then 
uh, is it a, if it has a vx, then if we want to know what is the component in this direction, that's vx sine phi. Or what was it? Phi. Yeah. So let's now look. So we, we need an expression with uh, vx sine phi, and we need some plus or minus a omega. Well, this is a sine phi, should do. Plus or minus omega, should do. This one is cosine, no can do. Cosine, no can do. Cosine, no can do. Right? Okay, next question. Yes. Okay. Fresh in the room? No. So this is about today's topic, right? Uh, 55 over 47. Yeah, I have to explain, right? So what is going on? Um, well, the torques are not just some constant thing times the angular rate, uh, angular uh, accelerations. It turns out that in space, uh, all kind of spooky things happen. It's not simply mass times acceleration. We always have a convective term. Now, all these three have sort of convective terms. Um, uh, these are a bit alike. Uh, the only difference is that there's a change in order here. So that, that is hard to grasp. These uh, are both correct answers because um, the, the torque is actually the change in the uh, angular momentum. And angular momentum is, mass, is this I times omega. And the change is uh, well, the change in i times omega, and the change in uh, i times the change in omega. But we have a very convenient way with the transport theorem to write that as omega cross i omega. So both answers are in this sense correct. Okay, last question. I'm talking like objects like this, right? What is stable? Around this axis, or this axis, or this axis? You can do the experiment if you have something like this. Try. Or go through the math.
perfectly okay. Uh, not any extra. Okay. Check the result. Okay, uh, ta -ta -ta. this is square one, that's good. And this, okay, then we go to. Oh, what is wrong with the mic? The mic is perfectly okay here. Oh, yeah, maybe I was blocking it with my hand like this. Or uh, we can check sounds. I, I hear perfect sound over here. Oh, it's dropping out sometimes. Uh, okay, well, I, I can... Uh, I see, I see. Okay, uh, I can switch to another mic. That's no problem. Switch to another mic. That's no. Problem. Uh, let me check again. Finally, how this works. Switch to another mic. That's no. Okay, that should work. Quality of the sound will be a little bit less, but uh, there will be no dropouts. Okay, that should work. Quality of the sound will be a little bit less, yep. but... Uh, Super, okay, uh, where's my thing? Hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, so today's topic, Newton Euler equation of motion for 3D rigid bodies, and we're going to make a start with rotation matrix and Euler angles. Now, um, if you look at the word, I say Newton uh, Euler, and then equations of motion, eh? and 3D is uh, the big thing. So wh what we're actually doing is from 2D, today we move out to 3D. Now, if we take the first part, the, the, the Newton part, that is sort of super simple, because uh, in the case of the Newton part, as we're now focusing on this one, we had like a point mass, eh, a thing with mass m, and uh, two directions, x and y, and then uh, the only equations we had, like the sum of the forces in the x direction is mass times acceleration, and the sum of the forces in the y direction is mass in the y. That was it. 
Okay, that's for a point mass. And if we then go to a three-dimensional world, and uh, and then we have three axes, x, y, and z, and it's sort of magic that you understand what I draw here, because this is flat, right? That there, there, there is no third dimension of my paper. But your brain and my brain, they are sort of synced in a way. Uh, we, we have this way that we recognize with our 3D vision thing, oh yeah, this is something in space. But don't be fooled, it's flat. But I mean some projection of a, of a spatial thing. Yeah? Okay, three axes, so three directions, eh? like uh, back and forth, up and down, left and right. And orthogonal. Then what do we write? We say, well, the sum of the forces in x is m x double dot, sum of the forces in the y is m y double dot, and the sum of the forces in the z direction is m z double dot. Super simple. Okay, so now let's move to the Euler part. Well, I want to do the Euler part in the three in the two-dimensional world. Well, if I remember well, it was something like the sum of the torques, and then I have to do a special point, so I have to draw a new figure, because now suddenly we, we are talking about rigid bodies, eh? something with an extent, with dimensions, not shrunken to a, to a zero-dimension thing with mass, but it as an extension. And then we, we have the what we call the center of mass here, COM. And then for that COM we say, uh, oh yeah, I want to use C. Item picker. So the COM is, is at C. For the sum of the torques at C, we have the mass moment of inertia at C times the angular acceleration. So two things happened here for Euler. We suddenly have a thing called orientation, phi. And we should be clear what we mean by that. Well, we, have a, we had a line drawn on the body. And then the reference of that line with respect to some axis, and in our case we, we take, for instance, the horizontal axis, and we use an angle, phi, in, in radians, to denote the orientation. And that is the, the, the way we describe orientation. So we draw a line on the body, and then we follow what is the angle between the line and the horizontal axis. And then for that change in orientation, we have this form. Now, uh, do we remember what was IC? That was a complex thing. That was an integral, right, over the whole body. Does anybody remember what the mass moment of inertia is by definition? Yeah, it's the distance squared, x squared plus y squared, times dm. So if you take a piece of mass here, eh, dm, then you just take this distance, and then uh, it's the distance squared, that's very simple, and then uh, you add that all up over the whole volume, and then you get a thing which is apparently mass times distance squared. So the units, and I probably do it wrong but, uh, with the brackets, but uh, I, I, use curly, I have to use curly brackets according to Hayek, I think. But I should have forgot. Well, I don't know. Uh, I do it wrong, but um, sorry. Uh, so the, the, uh, the units are a kilogram meter squared. So. Uh, if the mass is, is twice the distance away from the center of mass, then the mass moment of inertia becomes four times as large. Okay, so how is this then in 3D? Does anybody know? Yeah. Do we get three inertias about three axes? I re I remember something like, uh, okay, yes, we have we have three torques. So um, we can say the sum of the the torques, and, and it's, it's three-dimensional, eh? 3D vector, is, um, 
and I remember that there was a thing called a mass moment of inertia matrix. So that's a, a three by three. So that's nine numbers and not three, right? Times the uh, angular acceleration. I have no clue what it is yet, but uh, it's something. It has, yeah, this is an angular acceleration. This is also an angular acceleration. And then if I remember well from the quiz, it was a plus omega cross i omega. I think from memory that is the order equation, but I have no clue why it is like that and how it works and and why we all have this extra ballast and can we not get rid of this? I mean, wouldn't it be more simple to only use this? Well, apparently not, because Orly tells me I need I need this. So. I first like to discover where does this all come from. And to do that, we have to step back. So we have to go back to our two-dimensional thing. And although we know what the mass moment of energy is by definition here, uh, we sort of forget what the, how we got to that thing. And and therefore we have to to yeah to to look at what was the origin of this whole thing. Okay, so it started with we have some rigid body. And then uh, within that rigid body, I have some piece of mass, uh, dm. And I need a coordinate system. What did I do? Oh, yeah, I do it with respect to the center of mass, c, and I call this x prime and y prime. Oh, y prime, so this is fixed to the body. So I have a position vector for this one, uh, xi prime and yi prime. So piece of mass. And... I have accelerations in, in the x and the y direction, and I still don't know what they are, but this, this part can have an acceleration in the x direction, x double dot i, and this part can have a direction in the y direction, right? And that's it, because we're talking about a, a, a point mass, a piece of mass. Now, um, in the spirit of um, d'Alembert, we can also say, well, this looks a lot like there are sort of forces eh, on this body, inertia forces. So you could also say, oh yeah, I have this body here, and then on this, this piece of mass, uh, dmi, I have inertia forces. And I have, a, 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 a because it's a small piece of mass, df um, inertia in the x direction, and I have a df inertia in the y direction. And again, the position is xi prime and yi prime. Okay. So, and, and that's just d'Alembert. And what says, what does d'Alembert say? Well, um, that the inertia force, what was it? Was a minus m, oh, oh, too quick, too quick. Was minus mass times acceleration. Eh? That was the trick. So in this case, I would say, oh, apparently the, the inertia forces are defined like this. The inertia force in the x direction is minus dmi uh, x double dot i, and the inertia force in the y direction is minus dmi y double dot i. Okay, so now we have an idea of forces. Well, if we, have, if we know what the forces are, the inertia forces, then we can also calculate what the torque is about c of these inertia forces. Yeah, so... Uh, the inertia torque, you could say, uh, at C is. Well, how do we do that? Well, for torque, we need distance times force, right? So uh, that dmi is apparently, uh, well, first is, uh, so we need a sign convention. So what do I usually do for a rotation? I take this as plus. So x times... Uh, the y force, and that's uh, plus, huh? so that's xi df inertia uh, i, and the, uh, from the i part of the mass. And then this one times this distance, this force, and that is the other way around, it's negative, so that's minus uh, df inertia xi. So it's x times the force in the y, minus y times the force in the x. And then, of course, the whole inertia torque, oh, I should have written inertia, inertia torque, 
the whole inertia torque is of course the sum of this or uh, the integral of the thing over the volume. So just integrate it. So that is the trick. And then if we do this, then the idea would be that the final answer should be this. Right? But it's sort of magic. No, we expect back to 100. No. So finally, after some elaborate work, we should expect this. Yeah, sort of magic. So let's let's go back again. So then, what would what do we need? Well, we need expressions for these inertia forces. Meaning, if we need expressions for the inertia forces, we need expressions for the accelerations. So we have to step back again and go to back to our kinematics. So we have to look at a body which is uh, translating and rotating, and then see what are the accelerations. So that's just simple kinematics. And uh, I have it here somewhere in the book, so I'm going to write it again. I'll draw my potato. I draw my coordinate system with x and y. Then I have this piece of mass here, this dmi. And, 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 yeah. and uh, now I want to know what are the accelerations. Well, for the accelerations, we can say the accelerations in the uh, from x i is of course well we have point c. Point c can by itself also accelerate, right? So it starts with the acceleration of point c, and then. Uh, if we have this angular acceleration, we have this angular angle, but we also have a speed and we also have an acceleration. Now let's first look at the speed. So if we have an angular speed, then of course this piece has a has a, like this centrifugal acceleration in this direction, right? So let's put again the it is y and this x i. This was the x. Well, there's if there's this angular speed, then I have in this direction my uh, omega uh, times r, right? But I can decompose it in two directions. So let's just draw it with a proper sign. So there is a, for this direction, I have a, in this direction, a phi dot squared times, and then we have to take this distance, right? So xi. And, uh, yeah. and then uh, for the other one, I have this direction, and again, that's pointed in this way. So that's a phi dot squared y. Yeah? So that's a centrifugal. So here I can write, what did I write? Minus, uh, oh. So in the x direction, what did I do wrong? Oh, no, I did uh, Minus xi phi dot squared, right? And, of course, for y, I can write the same. Y dot dot C. You get minus one. That's good. Now, finally, we have to take the, the angular acceleration into account. And what does that mean? Well, if there's an angular acceleration like this, then I have a component in that direction. And that's phi double dot times this distance, uh, xi. And uh, in that direction, so that's in this one, and that's phi double dot. What was the uh, y? Yeah. So for the x, I now oh I get a, a minus yeah apparently minus uh, y i phi double dot and here a plus x i phi. Double dot. So now I have the accelerations in of this piece of mass. The only thing is I have to multiply it now with d m and then take the integral, right? So, for the dmi, I have to take, well, I sort of forgot what it was. What was it? x times df in the y direction. And, yeah, so xi df inertia in the y direction minus df inertia in the x direction. And the df inertia is, of course, this times the dm, so I get finally my dmi is my xi times, in the y direction, I have to take this one, y double dot c minus i dot squared 
close that's on double that. And then the other one that's with the minus sign minus y times uh, in the x direction. So this one x double dot c minus x on y dot square double dot. And then z that is times uh, let's extend it a little bit. Then everything is times t and i. Right. And then for the whole torque, I have to take the integral. Yeah? For the mi, I have to take the integral of this guy. And of course, for the piece dmi, uh, we, we, we could, could, could write out and we, have, we can look at the extension, etc. But now let's look at the integral and let's see which part is variable in the integral and which part is constant. So we have a number of constant terms, like a constant term is, a, let's uh, underline them, uh, the con a constant term is, yeah, uh, this, uh, the acceleration of the center of mass. That does not change with, with, the, with the piece of mass, and it's everywhere the same. And likewise, the angular uh, speed is everywhere the same on the bottom. And likewise, the angular acceleration. So. All these underlying terms are constant, and we can pull them out of the integral. So what then remains? And if we go term by term, for instance, let's look at this first term. So we have an integral of xi y double dot c uh, dmi. Well, we can pull the constant terms out of it, and we get an integral, eh, y double dot c, of xi dm. Now, if c is the center of mass, then what is the value of this guy? What is the integral of distance times mass? Yeah. Zero. Because that's the definition of the center of mass. For the center of mass, we said, well, oh, the integral x dm and the integral y dm, eh, the static terms, are zero. On purpose, we use that, that thing, the center of mass. So, by definition, that's zero. So, all the terms we find here, which are, uh, which are these, uh, these, these products uh, of a, a linear term times something, they go away. So, so this term goes away, and this term goes away. Yo, that's, that's good. Now we have xi phi, phi dot squared, but plus, and here we, have, uh, here we have a minus, and here we have a plus. So these two cancel out. So this and this one cancels out with the, uh, this one times this, cancels out with this times times this, right? Bzzit, 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 with the plus minus. So they go away. Remaining this one, so the remaining thing is apparently the integral of xi squared plus yi squared phi double dot dm. And again, we can pull out the, the constant term for the body, so we get integral xi squared plus yi squared dm times phi double dot. And lo and behold, that's exactly what our definition was. Yeah? That the Euler equation, yeah, the sum of the torques at the CM, is this mass moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So, perfectly the definition of this one. And why does it work so neatly? Why, why did we get rid of these terms? Because we use the CON. Yeah? That's an important thing for this point C. Would you have used an other point? then things would not drop out, and we get all this coupling. Okay, so that is, now Now we sort of understand uh, where we are in a two-dimensional world. So let's go back and uh, recap. Uh, now we know, uh, the big question was, we go from 2 to 3D, this is point mass, that's easy. Orientation is we don't understand, we, 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 uh, we, we can look up the equation, but we don't understand. Then we thought we should understand this, uh, but now we know sure where this all comes from. 
and this is mass modulation. Okay, now to the three-dimensional world. How does that go? Well, then we have to draw a new picture, this three-dimensional thing. Uh, yeah, so I have to draw a potato, right? Like this, so suddenly now it's a spatial thing. So we have some reference frame, uh, and yeah, we call that usually an inertia frame, and then the inertia frame is a, what did I use? Oh, just X, Y, and Z. And then there's a big difference between an inertia frame and a coordinate system. And I always try to remember, um, a frame is just directions, and a coordinate system is that we have an origin. Ah, so I also have an origin. It's where I live. For instance, or where you live, or where you like to be. Any point you like, you say, oh, that's my reference point. And you have reference directions. Well, they are not so hard uh, on Earth, reference directions. Um, the easy one is the Z, which we usually identify with the vertical, which is, by the way, very hard to measure exactly what is the vertical. But that's a detail. And then we have two other directions, and you can take anything for that. So that's always the, the trouble when you explain where something is. Yeah, can you tell me where the station is? Well, you have to go there and then there and then there and then left and right. And so left and right is really horrible. And um, the Americans sometimes have a very good thing, and that is north, east, south, and west. So it's very useful to use these absolute orientations, to not say, well, the station is uh, left from the bridge on the right and but say well it's logically north from here so then you have to know of course uh, where where north east south and west is but you have an apparatus for that um, smartphone right uh, uh, there's a thing like a compass and then you can find out these direction it is very useful and you can decide what you want to do for x and y uh, north or east or okay so that's that's our reference frame and our coordinate system, if we say we have an origin. Then in the body, I have the same. I take a reference point, and, and most of you would already believe that I take a, a thing that I will take the center of mass, right? That's sort of a smart point. If we take this COM here, and I usually call it C, just a short. Uh, and then we, we glue on, on this body also a reference frame, uh, and on purpose, I. I to draw it in a different direction here, x, y, and something like this, x, no, no, that's not an x, x prime, y prime, and z prime. And we call this usually the body with nice curly letters, set the, from the b, that's, that's another frame, yeah, can orientate, and sometimes I draw this to really be clear, oh yeah, this frame is, is glued onto the body. So when the body changes, uh, that frame also changes. And then uh, within the body, I have a piece of mass, of course, again, RDMI. And, um, yeah, uh, I'll come to that in a second. Okay, so, how, and we have to keep track of this point in, in space, eh? no, not, not in the body. Because how do we do that? Well, usually we first travel to the body, and then in the body we tra travel to the point. That, that is a sort of a convenient way. So we say, where, 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 where is thou body, and then where is thou nose, something like that. So we say, well, if we want to know the position of this point, oh, that's not nicely drawn. Let's go back. Yeah, this one, which I will donate just by the vector x i. Eh? position of point i in, in space, then how do I get there? Well, the m best way is to first go to the, to the center of mass and then go to that point, and I will use a prime to denote that. Eh? The prime meaning it's in this prime coordinate system. So in, in, in formulas I say, well, how do I get to this point? Well, it's super easy. You first go to the center of mass, 
And then you go within the body a certain direction and distance. Why do we do that? Well, this, this vector has, has very nice properties within this frame. It is within this frame for a rigid body, so we're talking now rigid bodies, for a rigid body, this, this x prime i is sort of constant. And I say sort of constant, okay? because it's constant in the body. Or in other words, my nose will always be relative to my ear here. It will not change. Well, the, well I'm a bit flexible, so it can change, but your nose is always in front of you, and your ears are always on the side. And your mouth is always beneath your, your nose. And that, that will not change. You're almost a rigid body. So in that sense, these points do not change. But of course, if my head turns, suddenly my mouth can be above my nose. Because above is something with gravity. And up, up and down. Ah, coffee, because it's this is complex. Coffee. <coughs> Thank you.